So good evening to all of you. Thank you all for making the time to attend the event today here at GT. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Communication, I extend a warm welcome to all of you. Um, as you all know, this event is a conversation with Professor Sanjay Asthana um, uh, about his new book, India's State-Run Media, uh, Broadcasting Power and Narrative, published by Cambridge, uh, Cambridge University Press. Uh, Sanjay Asthana is an alumnus of uh, Department of Communication, as many of you know here, uh, 92 batch. Some of his teachers are here also. Uh, he's also taught in the department from 93 to 96. Uh, our pleasure to have him here with us. Uh, I just want to add here that uh, this, uh, that the, the endeavor of the university is that GT should become a space uh, for outreach activities um, with the larger Hyderabad community. And this event is a part of that. We are hoping to have more events like this in uh, the GT space here in future too. Uh, the dialogue with Sanjay Asthana today about his book, uh, for that we have Professor Vinod Pavarala, UNESCO Chair on Community Media. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with Professor Pavarala. But before I hand over to him to take the program further, uh, let me request Professor B.P. Sanjay to please join us here along with Professor Pavarala and the author Sanjay Asthana to, for a formal launch of the book. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so, so welcome to this uh, book discussion with uh, Sanjay Astana. I'm not going to be too formal with uh, Professor Sanjay Astana. Uh, I have uh, known him now for more than 25 years, uh, having taught him way back in 92. Uh, of course, he's uh, grown to be an established uh, media scholar in his own right. And we are happy to have you back. Sanjay, and uh, happy to have you back in Golden Threshold, mm -hmm. where you had studied, and I'm sure uh, there's a lot of nostalgia for the place as well. Uh, before I say a little bit about the book, uh, just a brief introduction to Sanjay. Uh, so Sanjay Astana currently is a professor uh, in the School of Journalism and Strategic Media at uh, Middle Tennessee State University, and uh, he got his PhD in uh, journalism and mass communication from University of Minnesota after he left India in what, 2000, uh, no, 19, 2000, 19, I left 2003 that. is when you got your PhD. Yeah, 96. But yeah. he had also done an MPhil in philosophy after MA in communication here. So you will see a lot of philosophy in the book as well. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's uh, difficult to have a intellectual conversation with Sanjay for like half an hour without his coming up with some interesting philosophical insight. Uh, so he teaches uh, courses in visual communication, media studies, globalization, communication technologies uh, there at uh, Tennessee. He also interestingly worked in uh, All India Radio in uh, Uwani English uh, for a while, uh, where he uh, did a lot of interesting interviews mm -hmm. with uh, many uh, visiting personalities, I think including Noam Chomsky, if I remember. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sanjay was also into uh, documentaries, making documentaries on social and political themes. Uh, and I'm very happy to remember, as uh, Kanchan mentioned, that he taught in our department for about three years, from 1993 to 96. Uh, in terms of his research, he's been focusing a lot on globalization and media, post-colonial theory, cultural studies. Uh, of course, television has been a long-lasting interest of his. Uh, and uh, his research has appeared in some of the top journals in the profession, and uh, he has also authored books. Uh, for example, uh, there's a book called Youth Media Imaginaries from Around the World in 2012. And uh, he also did some very interesting work uh, with uh, Palestinian youth on uh, their media use. Uh, and there is a book called Palestinian Youth Media and Pedagogies of Estrangement. That's a 2016 book. And uh, Sanjay has been uh, uh, invited all over the world to talk about that work in particular by UNESCO and many other organizations. He was at a conference at MIT mm -hmm. recently where he was talking about uh, youth and media engagement. Uh, his latest book is uh, called India's uh, State-Run Media, 
broadcasting power and narrative uh, which is uh, as the title suggests is on television particularly uh, doordarshan although uh, there are uh, parts of the book where he is talking not just about doordarshan but also about radio uh, in terms of uh, indian television uh, amazingly with a almost 50 year history we haven't had too many book length works on indian television uh, if you discount uh, some of the really early ones uh, written by people like ul barwa or uh, on all india radio or uh, pc chatterji on broadcasting in india uh, there haven't been uh, you know solid academic books at least not too many uh, there are some i remember in this uh, department uh, in the early 90s teaching uh, anand mitra's uh, book mm-hmm. on television and popular culture in india which was a uh, critique of uh, mahabharat a lot of textual analysis of mahabharat uh, seventy nineen had a sort of uh, quasi academic you know journalistic book mainly called through the magic window television and change in india which came out in 1995 uh, there have been a few other books uh, let me mention uh, nilanjana gupta's book switching channels yeah. ideologies of television in india uh, purnima mankekar's very important book uh, screening culture viewing politics where she does an ethnography uh, in delhi on uh, the the way audience is engaged with uh, mahabharat so mahabharat has been written about uh, by by a couple of scholars then arvind rajgopal's uh, book politics after television hindu nationalism and the reshaping of the public in india where uh, arvind has written about uh, the viewing of ramayan mm-hmm. uh, so he goes back to that period to talk about the reshaping of uh, the media publics in india around the televised uh, ramayan yeah. uh, and he also brings in globalization consumer culture and so on uh, melissa butcher's book on transnational television shanti kumar's book gandhi meets prime time so sanjay's uh, latest book uh, joins this sort of short but quite an illustrious uh, list of academic work on uh, indian television so i'm glad uh, sanjay's book adds to our reading about television uh Sanjay, uh, the book from uh, what I've uh, read is a lot about, uh, of course, Doordarshan, it's state-run media, but it is also about television of the 1980s, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of it, and a little bit about the 90s, I think. Right. Uh, before we go into details of the book, uh, can you just uh, take us through the journey? I mean, what uh, made you uh, write this particular book, work on... Uh, doordarshan indian television at a time when people are thinking doordarshan is passe okay uh, first off i'd like to thank uh, vinod and kanchan for their introductions and you know also my uh, sincere gratitude to uh, the university of hyderabad uh, particular department of communication and uh, also uh, the cambridge university press uh, i would like to also mention my uh, teachers who are here uh, pavan manvi Uh, Mandi Saab, we used to call him, uh, B.P. Sanjay, uh, we used to, you know, he uh, instrumental in many ways and uh, mostly uh, Vinod, who, you know, I remember when I uh, was a student here, uh, he had come from Virginia Tech on his PhD fieldwork and he taught us a course, a couple of courses, so that gave me, in fact, inspired me and uh, to sort of, you know, look at, you know, media in particular, I was just a uh, young uh, adolescent you know young fellow who was you know doing media radio and you know trying to figure out uh, how i could sort of begin to think about uh, social issues around media in india so i would like to thank and but with that i would like to begin you know my main discontent was with theory so in a way i am uh, sort of raising the stakes here i am saying that you know uh, i would like to go outside you know the traps of theory right meaning you know you want to look at you know Uh, you have a lot of work that is being done west non west and you know you have something like the westernizing theory media studies you know a lot of people have written that orientalism you know edward said and others i was uh, not happy and i would not wanted to raise the you know the stakes so the early beginnings of the book uh, would be about you know when i was uh, here when i was finishing my ma in communication and mphil in philosophy uh, i just wanted to you know uh, delve deeper into it so i 
planned out my PhD program, uh, sort of research program. So I went to the University of Minnesota and conducted field work and you know extensive work for the last 10, 12 years. Was, so, was that on television also, the PhD work? PhD work was television in particular. Particularly the 80s is a very crucial uh, sort of reference point for me. Uh, but uh, I wanted to cast the net wide, so I looked at broadcasting. The beginnings with telegraph and you know, radio and then coming into you know, the colonial legacies of radio, uh, telegraph and then looking at television, the institutionalization of television. So the book is broad in the sense that it has a lot of themes around you know, several intersecting uh, ideas, concepts. And this is something that you have written over a number of years, I mean it's… Yeah, hmm. yeah. Uh, so for instance, I would say that if someone were, were to ask me what, what is the main uh, idea behind the book, I would say that it is a philosophical uh, account of uh, theory in particular, uh, media, uh, the relationship between theory and media and also the post-colonial as we understand. So it's an engagement, it's a dialogue with prior research that is being done, you know, scholars from anthropology, sociology, uh, political science, neo-Marxism, you know, uh, broad areas. So I put the stakes at a philosophical level because I was always dissatisfied with the mere textual analysis or a content analysis or some kind of an analysis, instrumental analysis of media. I wanted to look at the way in which concepts grow. How do you envision or think about a concept or a set of concepts? So that's where I would say that, you know, my book is a broader philosophical uh, engagement with uh, issues of media. Media is just a pretext for me, meaning I wanted to get into the larger debates about the beginnings of broadcasting, particularly telegraph. The British who were here, you know, Telegraph 1850s, you know, John Stuart Mill, uh, the great liberal philosopher, he wrote about uh, the memoranda, particularly talking about, you know, the Telegraph as seen as something which was, uh, was a progressive, you know, instrument of uh, governance, you know, the British colonial gov governments. So, uh, is that uh, something that you talk about as governmentality from Foucault? I mean, the way in which the British colonial Mm -hmm. rulers uh, have visualized mm -hmm. using media like radio mm -hmm. or telegraph even before that and the way in which our post-colonial elites have started using. Uh, so is that a strand that you pull? I mean I see mm -hmm. references to Foucault's governmentality mm -hmm. uh, and would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, before I get to the governmentality part, another thing that I would like to uh, talk about here, uh, you can hear me clear, right? Okay is the idea that you know uh, we have done a lot of you know in 90s you know when i was a student you know there was a lot of work in the united kingdom you know the british uh, cultural studies tradition right and then you had the screen theory which was you know again ideological analysis of media the political economy of media all of those are very deep uh, analysis of media power and media i was dissatisfied with that because if you look at you know the book you know 90s you know there was a kind of an hegemony you know, of, of theory, you know, that you can only do a negative critique, a negative analysis. So that's the reason why I look to Paul Ricker's work, which is a kind of a dual hermeneutics, a hermeneutics of suspicion, which is, you know, again, exemplified by uh, Marx and Nietzsche and Freud. And the other is the hermeneutics of restoration or a hermeneutics of trust, which is built because meaning is always surplus. There is more to what uh, ideological analysis would enable. So that is where I get into Foucault and you know Henry Lefer and other scholars in particular Ricoeur. So I conduct the dialogue. I clear the ground for a theoretical and philosophical ground in the first chapter introduction and then begin my analysis. That one thing. The other is that you know I think uh, when one is you know doing an analysis one has to be careful that you know uh, uh, in terms of uh, what are the theoretical uh, apparatus that you have. Meaning I am looking at India for instance you know. Uh, my theoretical constructs are, you know, something like, you know, the liberalism, John Stuart Mill, and, you know, you have uh, Locke, John Locke, and others, you know, who have developed, you know, particularly the idea of the religious, religion as a Judeo-Christian tradition, right? Meaning there is some kind of a discontent there. So I would like to clear the ground, and I was also dissatisfied, a discomfort with Marxist critiques of religion, because they were always ending short. And, you know, so that is the reason why I wanted to cast the net wide and look at the uh, genealogies of, you know, four terms, four concepts which are key to my work would be sovereignty, uh, the rule of power and legitimacy and all that, sovereignty and nation and public and religion. These are all intersecting concepts nation. and nation particularly. People have written about it like, you know, uh, Arvind Raj Gopal, Purnima Mankekar, 
Shanti Kumar, but I was not really uh, sort of still happy with satisfied with that. I wanted to really look at a broader within the social sciences and humanities. So I look at the genealogies of these four concepts, how they play out in the realm of broadcasting. The other is I'm using the double hermeneutic, right? Looking at surplus meaning, there is always excess of meaning. And that is where I conduct my analysis and I look at uh, broadcasting as an institutional structural level, looking at policies, uh, looking at doing a detailed archival work in relation to uh, broadcasting, you know, and looking at uh, particularly television programs of the 80s because 80s is a missing link. Several years back, there was a, there was a conference in Delhi at the, at the Nehru Memorial uh, Museum. They're talking about the missing 80s. There's something going on in the 80s that scholars have not really analyzed. There's always this, you know, look for the private media, you know, the satellite boom in the 1990s. And that missing link, the Doordarshan of the 80s, is seen as an empty signifier. And I wanted to really get in there and look at more closely. So I do a detailed uh, narrative analysis, not, I wouldn't call it a textual analysis, narrative analysis, Paul Ricker narr narrative. And I look at uh, uh, interviews with, I do interviews with uh, individuals, of, of course, from Hyderabad. Uh, not a representative and by the way all knowledge is partial there is nothing like an objective way in which you know I didn't go to Delhi Bombay but I interviewed people in Hyderabad uh, the not the high-tech city but the real Hyderabad the Barakatpuras <laughs> the Doli Chauki uh, the old city where you know the real you know that's where Hyderabad is so I thought you know I did an extensive extensive uh, detailed interview ethnography semi-ethnography and uh, I also looked at policies and documents and yes I looked yeah. at policies and other kinds of documents and materials these interviews are quite interesting. Maybe we can return to it mm -hmm. uh, later. But uh, some of his interviews uh, with people in Hyderabad, he was asking them to share memories of early television, uh, the way they remember uh, their childhood and how it was uh, intricately connected to television uh, and so on. So there's some interesting uh, material there. I'm sure we'll uh, get to that. So. A wide range of uh, data sources mm -hmm. uh, that have been used, including uh, actual programs mm -hmm. from that period. Uh, so, shall we uh, get back briefly about this colonial, post-colonial uh, dimensions of broadcasting in India? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, those of us uh, who grew up thinking that this using of uh, media for development with all those agriculture programs and health and all of that in the early 70s, even 60s, is a very unique sort of, you know, post-independence thing that mm -hmm. a Nehruvian government has done it. I think one of the things that you pointed out rightly is that it is actually in continuation of a certain colonial uh, logic about using media. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you share with us a little bit about those continuities and discontinuities between colonial visions of broadcasting and post-colonial elites who constructed broadcasting uh, in a particular fashion. So okay. what are the continuities, what are the ruptures you find? Yeah, I think, you know, it's an interesting thing to look at, you know, the way in which the colonial and the post-colonial seem to be, not as a sense in which, you know, it is the post after the colonial, but there is, I think, a constant uh, sort of a give and take, you know, the colonial development, uh, particularly in terms of media, the Britishers were here in the 1920s, they were envisioning and developing radio. It was called the rural radio, you know, uh, particularly uh, village radio. It was um, uh, uh, famous in the 1920s. Around the same time or even earlier than that, there were people, the British bureaucrats, like uh, some of you might remember Franz Luger Brain uh, and uh, Kirke and others who were, you know, part of the radio uh, in the 1930s. Also the field and report. Field and report. And, you know, you mentioned I have not cited Vinod's and Kanchan's work. I would like to mention, you know, it was an honest mistake. I could have, you know, <laughs> looked at it. But, you know, it was so much material for me to look at. But that's a fascinating study they have done. And I would So imagine. these early bureaucrats talked about village broadcasting. Village broadcasting. In a way in which, you know, the, they were mobilizing, you know, broadcasting to sort of, you know, uh, to uh, strengthen the colonial rule. 1920s is interesting because Gandhi on the one hand is mobilizing peasants in 1920-21. The Khilafat movement is on the march in the 19, right up to 1930s. And 1920s, the brain and others realize that, you know, Gandhi is mobilizing peasants in the rural India. And they are also mobilizing, you know, in a way it's like a kind of a guardians of a, a old, uh, you know, like an old British white schoolboy, you know, like they're sort of developing that. So the idea of development is already a transnational idea. Even having uh, to go, go back to the United States, there were people in the United States who were also uh, coming up with ideas of development that was connected with the colonial rule. In Africa, you see that 
to a great extent citizenship building you know but it is a subject building you know there were no citizens there meaning right so in africa particularly the british and others were perfecting the rule sovereignty here is working in a very interesting way you know and so the post colonial 1947 really there was not a break or a rupture it was still you know incorporating some of those things people have written about it like uh, david lelyveld and others have written about the idea that you know the whole structure was you know in toto was you know transplanted uh, the bureaucratic structure of radio you can see in interesting ways so the idea of development transformed itself and in the post colonial era particularly you know you see the radio rural forums uh, in the 1940s with unesco and others you know people you know a lot of people have worked on that so there is always that you know the tension there uh, about development so we never really got away from the colonial uh, sort of genealogy of development it came into the post colonial so in the 1970s and 80s the idea of the development that was enunciated by sociologists and others dubey and others in the 50s have done that is still is a very troubling legacy is there so i would i in my work i said i show those things very clearly as to you know we need to understand that it is a transnational development connected to a certain kind of a colonial logic a logic of rule a logic of sovereignty and also private interests were also there in in a way a subsequent privatization of media very interesting things that are coming up with you know so so what what would you see as any breaks in that uh, vision in the pre independence vision that uh, our elites have inherited uh, were there any uh, substantive uh, breaks or ruptures from that vision of media for development or you think until a particular time it was in continuation of that there were several yeah there were several i guess uh, other uh, sort of paths that were taken and not taken particularly you know the technocratic vision of the vikram sarabhai mm-hmm. and others and uh, professor sanjay bp sanjay has written a fascinating you know his phd mm-hmm. dissert simon fraser uh, fascinating look at the institutional legacies of you know the insat program and other site satellite uh, instructional television experiment which was massive around that there was also the keda program which is more smaller in nature and that really is interesting set of developmental themes taken there you know which also in a way uh, pushed forward something like the i'm not making those connections like koreans you know the uh, the cooperative development and you know the other swaminathans you know the green revolution and other kinds of things are in interesting ways you know uh, coming together and you know there, again there is a problem there because it's a middle class right mobilizing the you know the dalit question is there it is always there the rural you know the rural india the rural india but it is always you know galvanizing towards the urban the urban so that tension is there that is why i say that it is my book uh, two big uh, themes are there one is the spatio temporal dynamics of broadcasting space and uh, temp- time and the other is the intersecting genealogies of sovereignty nation public and religion i find that quite uh, sort of in a way disconcerting to see that you know that always the subject is a middle class subject thrown up always constantly the public is a middle class public so i see that even in the developmental debates uh, whether it is a technocratic uh, sarabhai or before that you know uh, for good intentions you know people you know bureaucrats and others you know envision that notion of development for good purposes but still uh, you see that you know that there are some uh, disturbing you know sort of continuities with the colonial form of sovereignty Uh, which is also like the you know uh, some authors have written about it like there's one brigupati singh who talks about uh, sovereignty as uh, drawing from georges dumezil's work which is the drawing from indian uh, ancient indian uh, that is the romulus you know he is trying to connect with the greek uh, romulus idea with uh, the varuna and the mitra varuna is a contract right the so development in the nature of the contract right the contract but also there is a very punitive state state which is punishing which is you know the form of force and power and that is where fuko comes in very you know in handy to sort of draw from there and look at you know the way in which development is being mobilized sanjay i think there is a substantial part of the book which is about narrative mm-hmm. and uh, the narrative identity of indian television uh, one of the things that you seem to be taking issue with is that a lot of works on uh, early indian television tends to portray it as this sort of a developmentalist uh, content mm-hmm. uh, even when there are there is narrative television uh, like serialized uh, fiction mm-hmm. uh, like hamlog it has always been talked about as a developmentalist realist mm-hmm. sort of narrative uh, i mean all of us have read in indian textbooks on uh, hamlog being a developmental mm-hmm. soap opera taking off from the mexican mm-hmm. and so on uh, 
you seem to be taking issue with that representation of uh, indian television pointing to other strands which tell you a different story mm-hmm. so would you like to share that here yeah? yeah a couple things before i get to the narrative part uh, the other uh, concept that i have proposed is that you know you can not see religion religious idea of the religious and secular as different separate they are intertwined so in my in my book i talk about religion and secularism as embedded imaginaries so you cannot really separate the two when you're looking at you know particularly television programs narrative programs so but, i look but this also is a point of departure from the prior earlier works on ramayana or mahabharat yes. on indian television yeah and it, in relation to hamlok thank you uh, relation to hamlok i look at you know uh, for instance uh, a lot of authors and scholars have talked about it as a developmentalist uh, pro development even veena das but there's some really fascinating insights in her work her essay called on soap operas anthropological look she talks about uh, the katha tradition the 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 nautanki other modes of narrative modes which are more eclectic you know the idea of narrative as a katha is a, you know sanskrit in you know, a narrow to say it's a word which is latin origins but it is a narrow is to know narus nar so that if you look at the genealogy of the term itself it has you know long roots into you know intellectual traditions of india uh, and also connecting with persian ideas uh, about uh, dastan dastan goes you know people who <coughs> narrate so there is a rich rich literary and uh, and traditions which are more uh, in tune with my way in which i am looking at hamlog and a whole host of like i look at examine uh, neem kapir for instance uh, which is again uh, a fascinating look at you know uh, the rural uh, zamindari Uh, muslim zamindars and the you know the working class and also the uh, dalit identity there you know i look at godan for instance uh, premchand's godan i look at uh, which Maila, is a literary text converted text it co- converted to uh, film, television yeah. se- series uh, look at maila anchal uh, phanishwar nath renu uh, regional literature they call it but it is much more fascinating uh, look at you know indian uh, narrative traditions in television and there was a series called katha sagar katha sagar which was actually which, stories and literature where, yeah so there's lot of that and also they were if you guys remember in the 1980s was a rich rich uh, body of work on doordarshan regional television you know i would wait to watch uh, a telugu cinema or a tamil cinema or a kannada cinema so there's a lot of regional uh, sense broader so my question was you know there is an excess of meaning here there is a surplus of meaning and if you're doing an ideological analysis you miss that and so the literary traditions of india uh, rich uh, repositories of knowledge you know connecting with persian urdu hindi hindi also not the single sanskritic in hindi but the braj bhasha the kari kari boli of the middle you know and then the tamil uh, and the telugu uh, uh, work malgudi there's a lot of you know a lot of broad range of uh, sweep of programs there is a lot there when i'm interviewing people in hyderabad i could see that you know the way in which they are connecting their memories of those literary traditions they're speaking more so the idea of narrative although i draw from paul ricker i depart from his work and i connect with the whole and i'm saying this because there are a lot of other south asian scholars like francesca orsini and others who have written about the hindi the textual you know work in print books in india medieval india and also there were sheldon pollock and others from you know who've written about uh, philology and other kinds of things so that i think you know i'm looking at outside of the orbit you know is there a way to get out of the trap of theory as so when you say that uh, your work uh, sort of departs from ideological uh, i mean predominantly ideological analysis of television you are saying that many of those analysts have tried to uh, look at the television text as some kind of uh, text with hidden ideologies mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and their task as interpreters has been to uncover mm-hmm. right and mm-hmm. also looking at ideology as false consciousness mm-hmm. in yeah. a marxist sense yeah. mm-hmm. so your work uh, i mean is it correct to say that departs from that in a way that you bring in a more aesthetic mode of interpretation of television text in india to actually look at the narrative traditions mm-hmm. uh, the indigenous forms from which mm-hmm. they have derived is Ex- that- excellent way of you know contextualizing and saying what i am planning uh, althuser for instance louis althuser and uh, the whole marxist uh, tradition uh, misses the bus in the terms of you know the meaning how do you really understand meaning when audience make meaning or when people read literary and you know read uh, narrative uh, texts that they come to them 
basically you know 1970s and 80s as I said screen theory uh, I still remain within the orbit of Marxism neo Marxist framework I don't depart from them I still you know because there's a lot that Marx is right in, in many ways uh, but I am a Marx in the sense Marxism without guarantees for instance Stuart Hall right 1980s and 90s when uh, Thatcher and Reagan were you know envisioning a kind of a radical conservative movement you know which saw that neoliberalism rise of neoliberalism so that way I am departing yet remaining within the ambit because Ricker is the same you know he is, is paying homage to Nietzsche Freud and Marx for their detailed getting into the meaning you know like detailed interpretation looking at the negative uh, meaning you know negative sets of meanings but also he is proposing a, a double hermeneutic right the, the the hermeneutic of restoration positive meanings meanings that are more in excess and you just can't get that with a Freudian framework so what I'm saying is yes to to your point uh, we know that I'm looking at the aesthetic elements uh, not as a kind of an additive logic from the West that you have to borrow but looking at the indigenous when I say indigenous is also a, a very you know uh, kind of a difficult terrain there because you know indigenous is not a singular thing there are many plural uh, approaches there plural ways in which you know people make sense so I'm also getting past that and trying to look at uh, understand uh, te the text television uh, narratives and how I would you know I would do the dual analysis so yes departing from a certain kind of a rigid Marxism of a science science of Marx scientific Marxism of an Althusser and a Freud's uh, you know like a you know that kind of word but more into a grounded approach. Uh, so uh, you had a little while ago mentioned religion mm -hmm. and religion and secular. Uh, you are also challenging that religion and secular as binaries, uh, which you find in the works on Ramayana, Mahabharata and others. Uh, I mean, this is a very contemporary debate in India, right? I mean, to look at the religion and the secular domain. So how do you approach this issue when you say that people are missing the bus when they look at religion and the secular as binaries. Uh, so what aspects of Indian television of that period do you look at which tells you that these are not binaries? Sir? Yes, great. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, I, uh, religion itself, I do a very, in the introduction itself, a very philosophical analysis looking at Kant's essay, Immanuel Kant's essay called Religion Within the Boundaries of Reason. Uh, there are two interpretations of that you know I look at two there are many several interpretations uh, Gayatri Spivak's you know uh, one deconstruction the other is Rikers you know more hermeneutic grounded so both of them talk about a transcendental the idea of the transcendental which is separate from religion or religious uh, but still they are trying to recover a space within which they could you know develop an idea of religious which is broad but still which is within the Abrahamic and the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, the people in the philosophy of religion particularly Purushottama Bidimoria uh, and many others who talk about even uh, I think uh, uh, Rajiv Bhargava and others uh, if you look at their recent writings they're coming around to the point that you know they're more to it than just you know creating a separate binary Ashish Nandi of course you know I've done a very thorough uh, philosophical uh, overview of uh, secularism debates in India they've been you know T.N. Madan, uh, Nandi and many others you know Akhil Bilgrami particularly a very fascinating philosophical look so what I am saying is that you know you can not see them as binaries they are embedded Gandhi for instance is a very famous figure Gandhi you know Nehru would say the idea of dharm nis nirpekshta and dharm nispakshta these two you know variants of secularism nirpekshta and nispakshta and then Gandhi is more deeply religious and a man but still he was able to enunciate and articulate a very uh, ethical and a moral ground within which you know one can you know uh, conduct and look at religious so I think what I'm saying is that you know I looked at uh, uh, Gul Gulshan Gulfam uh, on Kashmir in the 1980s I looked at Choli yes. Daman Do some of you remember yeah. the serial, yeah. Gul Gulshan Gulfam about the Kashmiri uh, boat uh, you know uh, and then the fascinating you know it's novel that has come out recently uh, about Kashmiri Pandits and Muslims they're living you know uh, not like a kind of a Kashmiriyat as kind of a you know but it is a deeper look though meaning you, you can you know you can do an analysis and just ignore it but there is deeper meaning in it and that is where I see both uh, religion and secular connected there the other is uh, Choli Daman Hindu and Sikh um, uh, relationships the fictional series in the 1980s uh, the question I'm posing here is that again uh, for instance ideas of Ibadat Ibadat as in, in you know worship uh, 
bhakti in hindi you know hindu tradition bhakti ibadat uh, belief for instance cannot capture the density of ibadat and bhakti the interpersonal relationship that you have with your faith and god and you know there is a problem there when i want to just segue and mention that uh, anand patwardhan had done a documentary on uh, workers in bombay and uh, bhirgupati singh has done a fascinating you know look at that it appeared i think in epw uh, about you know the marxist marxist documentary on a worker a hindu worker is saying you know about god and about ram uh, and there you know they see the discrepancy there that wo aadesh denge meaning he's the worker is saying that you know uh, i will not raise my you know he's fighting against the the management he's saying wo aadesh denge ram for instance the idea of ram that wo aadesh denge means if he gives me the you know but it is mistranslated so marxists tend to you know for instance you know ignore either ignore or just don't have the resources intellectual resources or look at uh, belief as false consciousness belief as false consciousness now i make want to mention here that when i say religion secular is embedded imaginaries i am moving away from uh, the hindutva forces meaning i am not contemplating or even talking about you know the contemporary uh, in india for instance you know that is also a very dangerous you know uh, position to take so when i am saying that you know i am looking broadly at emancipatory and egalitarian approaches so that's why i would say that my approach is heterodox you know i am not remaining within the orbit of a marxism but i am not also remaining within the orbit of you know uh, in the thralls of a western theory but looking broadly and within my own uh, intellectual uh, formation looking at uh, analysis of intellectual traditions whether they are from india or abroad uh, outside uh, or even critique of within the tradition so i think you know that is where you know there is a rich body of work and i think we can begin to look at it religion and secular as embedded and you know you can get away from a very anti modernist perspective of uh, nandi and also from a very politics of despair of deepesh chakravarti you know you can ground yourself in the politics of hope where you can begin to see a set of meanings that are emerging and you can engage with tradition and get into the tradition the idea of a tradition and engage with that and come out with a more broader understanding the the more you understand the better you you know understanding the more understanding is needed here this is of course a larger argument and debate around this not just around uh, not just on television but we can come back to that i just have a couple of other questions and then we can throw it open uh, to to the audience to ask you some questions uh, you you say something in the book about the indian broadcasting public and the construction of that audience uh, so have there been uh, certain shifts in the way that audience has been constructed by all india radio and doordarshan and more recently in the post liberalization period yeah so the, we all know the debates right on the public broadcast public broadcasting public uh engage with south asian scholarship on the on the issue but the idea of early colonial public was a public which was again uh, uh within the rule of you know the sovereignty the power within which you know there's a very docile and very you know inert public and you know me- the messages of development you know whether it is you know the colonial time 1920s and 30s even in 50s 40s 50s when doordarshan you know early beginnings of doordarshan you had the farmers programs and others uh, around delhi and others so that envisioning of the public <coughs> continued and then it was i think the negative way in which the public was defined by the colonial uh, british uh, perpetuated itself until the 1960s when there were other transformations in the in the rural uh, countryside when you begin to see uh, debates within uh, within all india radio with vivid bharti particularly keskar's you know bb keskar who was the with vivid bharti which was coming from sri lanka and you know they began to air popular music and all that so the control of public changes there and pop- set up an audience uh, unit research unit a long time ago yeah audience research unit was set up uh, there's an interesting uh, piece by daniel uh, dayan from france he talks about how doordarshan was very uh, irresponsible in the way in which you know you saw that the heaps of letters that audience sent they were thrown around and they were you know nobody cared about it it was you know like a mound of Uh, letters so really on the one hand the audience unit is there and i was working in yuvani and sai would know there was a audience unit and i would go there and we would read the letters from uh, the audiences who would request music and so the notion of the audience that was constructed was i think it was mathur uh, who said that darshak darshak as a spectator in the 40s they were trying to figure out a way to you know understand audience in the british you know bbc 
debates and Mathur was talking about Darshak, Telugu Darshakulu, Darshakulu spectators. So I have uh, some discussion there about spectators uh, or you know in Urdu and in, in my language Urdu, I speak Urdu and Hindi and also Telugu, uh, Darshakulu and they also, uh, there are certain words I am forgetting that but you know right now I couldn't remember but. So it's words like Prekshak. Prekshak and you know Prekshak. Nazreen, Prekshak, uh, they have more meaning, right? Meaning it is not just the audience that it will capture, that there is more to it than just the word. So there is a certain way in which, you know, you can do a, uh, within the philosophy of language, particularly ordinary language philosophy, I use that resources in my final uh, couple chapters, you begin to see a more nuanced understanding of, of the... And of when you talk to these people about their memories, what are some of the fascinating things they have said, I mean, in terms of their engagement with early television. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, I mean, it was not just through interviews, right? You also study people's blogs. Blogs and online, YouTube yeah, yeah. Uh, uploads and other kinds of online materials. I look at that. Interesting ways in which, you know, people remember, all of us remember our childhood, so part of the memory, right? Memory device, devices that we have. I was looking at idea of the nostalgia as, you know, Scholars have said that nostalgia is something that is, you know, uh, negative. It has to be, you know, you have to get rid of that. But there are some others who have said that there is a productive aspect to nostalgia. And then Rickard's own work, Memory History Forgetting, is a massive tome on the way in which, you know, he's talking about memory. So recuperating memories, traces of memories. There is no way in which you could remember everything, right? Meaning there is no objective way. Memories are always partial. Memories are always uh, disconnected. Memories are, you know, bits and pieces that we cobble together in our understanding but the point is that we are not i am not looking at you know a holistic way in which you know you are looking at objective memories but looking not at necessarily at the accuracy of the memory. accuracy of the thing i am more interested in what they remember how they remember the politics of memory for instance and what i remember i see that you know in my own um, way in which i am looking at the the materials here uh, 19 uh, the durdashans remembered fondly uh, maybe the childhood uh, growing up period, you know, 1980s, early 80s, the beginnings of uh, uh, regular broadcast with uh, commercials and others. Uh, first time Indian audiences are you know, exp exposed to that. And then the beginnings of the corporate, uh, you know, private, uh, you know, uh, commercials and other kinds of things. So that's a new thing. And I remember one of your respondents talking about Indira Gandhi's assassination and the funeral mm -hmm. on live television. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I look at a Sikh. Uh, I met with you know. There's an interesting old city, Kishan Bagh. If you remember Kishan Bagh, in 1800s, you know, Kishan Bagh, you know, like uh, the Khuli, Khutub Shah, not the Khutub Shah, the Nizam. Uh, yes, with Maharaja Ranjit Singh, he got some, you know, Sikh soldiers to come here to quell the Yemeni tri tribes who were Yemeni who were making, you know. So a lot of about 2,000 uh, Sikhs came to Hyderabad. They were settled in Kishan Bad. So there's interesting history there, right there. There's a big Gurdwara and also then a couple of years back there was a clashes, communal clashes, right, in Kishan Bad. But I had a respondent, you know, I met with him, semi-ethnography. So he remembers very vividly about the assassination of uh, Gandhi, but also the killings of Sikhs in around Delhi, uh, which he said, you know, why should I forget? Meaning he was, you know, I gave him the prompt and he was uh, talking about it. And we tend to, you know, there was a partial coverage of that. There was no coverage of that. Uh, particular other issues were there. So the the point I'm making is that people remember in different ways, fond memories of, you know, uh, the serials, you know, whether it is, you know, Hamlog or Bunia, the primary, you know, but later, you know, you had Yeju Hai Zindagi, you know, uh, sitcoms and others, you know, you had, uh, uh, Many others, you know, which were, you know, series of programs and within that you have a literary trace, Sham Benegal and others, literature, you know, was very, both literature from, you know, Dostovsky and others, uh, inter international literature, a rich flavor, rich, rich body of work. And that was an interesting phase in, 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 in the state regulated television with the rise of privatization and others, you know, the idea of public changes. By the way, I'm also connecting with the 1996 Supreme Court judgment on public. Uh, which was a kind of a corporate, uh, private understanding of the public. The judgment that said airwaves are public property. Public property. It is a very controversial, the way in which these guys were envisioning the public. Ritu Birla has done a fascinating work in the capitalist rise of capitalist class in 1940s and 50s, where the idea of the public in the juridical discourse, the legal discourse, was there, meaning the idea of the public uh, drawing from, they were drawing from the 1920s Radio Act in the United States. So the whole uh, the policy transfer of meanings that the Supreme Court is beginning to put in place 
although it is a cricket association of bengal and uh, you know the broadcast of doordarshan right meaning the rights but the public that came up was a disturbing notion of public and after that you know you all know with the private corporations coming in local private television networks and all that it has moved from the state so i should also mention i mean one of the strands in your four conceptual things you mentioned sovereignty nation uh, public nation. religion so the idea of the nation and the engagement with the nation comes out quite interestingly in your analysis of the music videos uh these were of the 1990s right 1990s right. during the no, kargil no. kargil around kargil just before that uh, if you see that in the 1980s there was this mile sur mera tumhara mm. and there was you know uh, mules you know the ek chidiya anek chidiya you know they were all na- unity in diversity nation building right but in the 1990s nation building takes a very different turn it's a private corp with uh, uh, rahman and others you know who were beginning to uh, envision you know vande mataram and other kinds of things where corporate uh, capital was you know private corporations and all that so very big jump from one idea of the public to the other and the kargil war and the jingoism and the the way in which you know it was you know kind of uh, with pakistan as the other right meaning you know you see that constantly and uh, during the 90s it is where i analyze uh, music videos uh, set of music, music videos and where i see the idea of the nation the trope of nation uh, becoming more and more uh, i would say it's kind of a cultural nationalism of a certain kind where you are ex- built on ex- exclusionary logics you know where you are excluding excluding and you know it was a urban hindu middle class that was on the ascendancy you know the hegemonic uh, idea of the nation if you are part of that in a way shrill jingoism patriotism becomes a very you know and it's a global phenomena today I meaning you can see that so yes 90s music video analysis so that that's probably the Uh, latest that sanjay comes in terms of television material in the book i mean mid 90s 96 in terms of the music videos the engagement with the supreme court judgment of 95 uh, so my question uh, sanjay is so what followed after that is not worthy of study any longer i, I know your your larger point about the missing 80s and uh, wanting through this project to recover the early history of indian television and so on i mean that's uh, important but i was just wondering uh, i mean you know paddy scannell and uh, mm-hmm. liu cards i mean mm-hmm. paddy scannell by the way has a uh, glowing endorsement of the book very well known television scholar uh, scannell and cards uh, have this edited volume in 2009 mm-hmm. called the end of television mm-hmm. with a question mark yeah. uh, and uh, so Uh, the the question they are raising mostly in the american and western context is is television dead you know in terms of its shared character uh, the the way in which people congregated around the television set mm-hmm. and shared something together so that sense of television mm-hmm. is that dead or the scarcity era of the 50s and 60s they were referring to that mm-hmm. so if you so where television viewing was shifting from a more collectivist to a more individualistic mm-hmm. sense right so can we say something similar about indian television of the 1980s and 90s i mean and after that is television dead no by the way uh, yeah I meaning you know uh, scanal is saying television is dead i you know have questions about that meaning television is not dead and he's making a polemical argument he's not saying it's dead but a very you know very nuanced analysis uh, but i would say that you know if you the, the trap of theory is there in front of me meaning i don't want to make a homology you know analysis with similar to you know what's happening in the west uh, or you know parts of the west whether it's an anglo american europe there, there rich work in middle east you know television is there in the middle east television is there in africa television is part in different countries in africa it's not africa is not a continent they're rich you know they're uh, the the sort of television that the indonesia far east asia so television is there brand turner and others write about it you know turner you know australian scholar uh, i say australian scholar because it's basically he says that himself that you know so we are all regional scholars at one level right meaning and we are also aiming so i would say that you know uh, indian context uh, it is the age of the broadband in us they talk about the post network television uh, it is the network era is over we are over the top content right meaning you're you're watching netflix you're watching hotstar you're watching uh, uh, 
couple other you know i my understanding of indian is from us you know i come here every year uh, to be with my mother mom and you know i just watch television and read newspapers so uh, what i'm seeing is that uh, it is a very different uh, way in which you know people are uh, there are similarities on the surface but there are ways in which you know people are accessing you know it's a very r diverse and a rich uh, regional television network whether it is in kannada tamil telugu highly political uh, spaces uh, media spaces post colonial media spaces uh, highly uh, i would say biased in a way uh, but i harken back to the 80s doordarshan where state regulated media at least you can engage with that meaning right meaning state media you know whereas today the private corporate uh, structures of the media whether it is global transnational media television networks or whether it is uh, local uh, private television you know which is politically highly charged it is difficult to come to grips with that so i would say that there was something in the state media state run media that we have never realized the potential maybe they were they are still there in the policies and i was talking to dr sanjay and we you know then uh, many others here uh, that there is something that you need to recover and we could do that if you really you know do a detail go deeper into and analyze it uh, that there is a potential there is an emancipatory potential there and it is you know people say that it is nostalgia but there is more to it than just nostalgia uh, television of the 80s uh, state run television you know uh, is more i think uh, uh, it's a kind of a different you know way in which you can understand but with the contemporary uh, channels uh, proliferation of channels networks this public is split you know public is split they are publics people talk about portable publics people talk about you know different ways in which they are talking talking about it so i would say that it is a splintered media space uh, and that is where stuart hall you know wrote when he wrote the book the piece called toad in the garden he was already saying that it is so powerful that communication that you know the media that it is you know it will eat you up meaning it keeps coming rumbling at you the private corporations with the media and all that the whole idea of the corporate social responsibility there is no space for critique whereas in the state run media you have those voices and you know you could really engage with you know that that's an endorsement of public broadcasting usha i mean yeah, yeah. you might uh, like to hear that mm -hmm. uh, so may, this might be a good uh, opportunity to turn to the audience i mean we have uh, a couple of uh, people who still work in public broadcasting who who used to work in public broadcasting we have uh, fellow academics from other universities from flu i see friends from telugu university from usmania uh, and our own colleagues from university of hyderabad Uh, so we can spend a little more time if you have questions to ask and comments to make uh, take the discussion forward yeah nagamalika yeah Sanjay is a very close friend of mine we started our phd journey together but then of course he's gone somewhere else and i'm very happy for you sanjay um my just one observation maybe but i just wanted to know uh you were speaking about the doordarshan of the 80s so there is a doordarshan even today the straight run media in the contemporary uh, you know uh, time where we are seeing a lot of private media uh do you think it is still relevant you're saying we can go back and then you know we can make it relevant but do you really think so how if at all you think so yeah it's a big question though meaning i think you know we there i said we can recover right meaning so there are spaces where you know as vinod said a certain kind of a public uh, broadcasting which is independent of the state uh, in a way i'm thinking not in terms of because i don't want to compare because we have talked about you know moving away from the binaries like you know united states has its own public broadcasting network but it is again controlled by the corporate you know uh, interests there but uh, you have in europe certain you know countries in europe maybe there is a way in which you could have a, a public uh, television which is more uh, debating issues uh, not so much about you know talking heads but debating genuine issues and talking about how you know bringing you know the reading public which is there always there right with newspapers for instance in the 70s and 80s people would read and debate and you know something similar to that could be there meaning if you could the state perhaps uh, needs to not politicize it's easy to say that but i guess uh, there is a space between uh, and vinod's and kanchan's work about community media 
uh, is very you know germane to this issue here that there is a space between the state and the private uh, uh, sector uh, where you could you know, begin to provide you know with in terms of uh, public uh, broadcasting when i say public it is you know uh, public you know as uh, understood you know but it is a genuine space for debating issues whether it is you know issues which are particular to the urban context or the rural context uh, talking about uh, diverse sets of ideas and you know i was talking to paddy scannell paddy was talking about uh, bbc and itv in the, the uk and you know uh, we had a good debate in a, at a conference and i think you know they we can draw out some good elements from different countries but contextualized to our own uh, environment here media environment but there is a space i believe you know we could uh, and media scholars should start writing on that and researching on that yeah. sanjay one question uh, see um, last two decades you look at there is this uh, you know large uh, large number of farmers are dispossessed and the whole farmers movement got attention in recent past apart from that we have a movement against uh, special economic zones coastal regulation zones by coastal communities if you look third we have uh, um, legislations that have come up because of public movement such as right to information act in rajasthan look at mkss uh, did you see any parallel the way uh, street run television um represented these stories in india the way state television us because uh, her question is also linked to this we have now uh, complete lumpenization of corporate media the whole uh, identity of arna for us is an outcome of you know um, whole pumping of money its politicization of media when we have a uh, very constructive works in the country that has contributed to certain set of legislations and also a movements that have stopped uh, you, you know a certain kind of land grabs in the country did you see uh, any parallel because you are trying to give a philosophical framework looking at the issues uh, 80s uh, before 80s in the 1950s you know uh, the unesco work by bhatt and krishnamurthy and others they have written about yashpal and others have you know talked great deal about rural television uh, particularly the kheda uh, kheda uh, which is in parallel to the site site was a more of a state mandated emergency during the emergency 1975 uh, site program was you know state uh, sort of program of the state but it had some really interesting uh, it was a failure largely people you know scholars have you know said that it failed but there are some elements there which could be you know very interesting kheda on the other hand was genuinely in a way Uh, looking at uh, the issues of farmers and all the again the middle class is there the urban middle class oriented uh, but they were looking at some of the uh, if i didn't analyze those narratives but there are many of the programs which were done in the local language and around hyderabad outskirts of hyderabad sc dubey's work they have taken from anthropology and in around uh, mumbai you know maharashtra uh, pune uh, there you know again i would say that you know the state was uh, sort of in a way constructing the rural uh, public as a like a, a beneficiaries of a you know inert beneficiaries like that is similar to i see that in uh, in U- us also passive public passive public uh, in in you know waiting for you know development to trickle down right uh, but today uh, when you mentioned the land grab and other kinds of things the scholars have said that in the 40s 50s also there was not really any genuine uh, caste uh, transformation in the caste structures right people in uh, punjab and other parts of uh, west they were taking they were the mainly the beneficiaries of the television uh, rural broadcast and the uh, the poor people the poor peasants and others who come from a certain caste uh, dispossessed and the marginalized were the ones who were suffering so there is no genuine transformation in the social structures in the 50s and 60s today as you're mentioning i have not analyzed the contemporary media you see that the special economic zones and other kinds of these are all the neo neo neoliberal logic that is based on the capitalist interest and all that they are displaced you know the farmers are displaced in the name of development you know for the whom and for what so that is a disturbing trend the other thing i would like to point out going back to malika's question also is that uh, with the rise of uh, disinformation global disinformation uh, via the social media networking sites it is a disturbing trend it you know it is you know the rise of authoritarian rule whether it is in turkey or philippines or you know united states or in the entire parts of europe austria hungary and other parts of the world there is a uh, very little 
very little you know debate everything you know like people who read you know there's like a echo chambers you know people don't want to engage with the other point of view and it is being self perpetuating through the digital media uh, which is again people talk about fake news which has become such a big but it is disinformation there's a certain kind of a journalism of a certain kind that needs to be done and done well and inform and educate the people and have dialogue and debate with the people so i think for that to happen we need to get out of the clutches of on the one hand with the private corporate interests and also the state but that's a pretty million dollar it's a big question right meaning how do you envision that different people have different theories and people have written about it pradeep thomas and others are writing about it uh, from you know from the global south global south being the outside of the west africa you know parts of you know uh, southeast asia south asia so i don't have a perfect answer to that but it is a disturbing trend uh, where you know we are lacking in excess of information uh, you know but very poor understanding there's a lot of information around but how much do we really you know we look at you know social networking messages and all that we hardly pay attention we need to require a certain set of cognitive skills a certain kind of a new media literacy a literacy which is going beyond the mere mere use of uh, uh, concepts or the competence to really have a deeper understanding and how do you do that you i think for me i would say that you start with children and young people at a school level you need to begin to have that as a subject itself where you begin to really question you know whether it is video games or whether it is you know uh, social networking and uh, other kinds of things that come out of that uh, questions of social justice social issues all sorts of things so i think that is a space where is i think is a very good space in my uh, quick you know un alliance of civilization i'm proposing that as a children you know at a toddler level to have media education media literacy and also not just to move beyond the competencies literacy in a genuine sense and that is where we can bring about trans- you have to question your own you know biases you know whether it is caste or race or it could be in others class for instance is still there with us you know those are the issues of the you know gender for instance Sanjay. We are really proud and happy that uh, our own product has uh, done this book. Uh, hosts of questions, but I am sure I'll engage with you once I get to read the book. I've just got the snippets from whatever you've just said. Uh, one is there is a, a, a problematic in terms of Uh, the flow with regard to uh, the transition from radio to television in the indian context and that's a huge gap mm-hmm. uh, 59 to almost 83 84 when it even the state on durdashan got stabilized is a fairly long gap except for stay 6 to 9 stations etc and that missing link uh, is not considerably explained mm-hmm. by the available literature except to state that the push in the name of modernization was to go the television way by adoption of that medium by the state in the site and other things mm-hmm. you have mentioned uh, second point is that even in the radio era uh, the gap between radio's introduction in india although you contextualize it in terms of gandhi ji's arrival and you know 24 25 early um there is a further gap in terms of what the viceroy and the british actually thought of radio in india and the very marginal altruistic perception of the zevin's kind of iron lecturer mm-hmm. kind of a argument we talk about a very peripheral army wives mm-hmm. conception of mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. that people have picked up as a colonial construct of development to have their own pattern um so that gap is a bit intriguing to me in terms of uh, construction of a narrative mm-hmm. 
of uh, broadcasting power and broadcasting i would assume it subsumes radio as well as television, television. Uh, second more theoretical point i have is uh, is there fundamentally uh, a distinction in terms of a descriptive discourse and the narrative uh, not just in terms of the term but in terms of you know what do you bring to narrative we have already talked about many theories etc but can there not be a a descriptive dimension of constructing memories audience perceptions and what it what does it mean to have a medium mm -hmm. last question is mm -hmm. the recovery is that a conscious concern or are we concerned about relevance of the public medium mm -hmm. recovery is a conscious state or a public driven movement mm -hmm. you recover the lost space relevance is the state as in europe and many other recognizes that if plurality liberalism and others have to exist mm -hmm. nothing but the state can do that guarantee that yeah is 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 uh, i don't know whether i'm clear but the binaries as you talk recovery relevance narrative descriptive mm -hmm. and the gap between 1959 <laughs> to the late uh, early 80s mm -hmm. of the era of television is a very strong uh, missing paradigm mm -hmm. and i still see a couple of raised hands but uh, if you can take a quick shot at uh, some of the concerns that sanjay is we can go to them yeah so you want to wait or uh, you want to get the comments and do it together it's your yeah i can yeah that way uh, i see uh, sundar at the back one of our senior alumni and i used to see you here sundar i mean he is a communication professional now in delhi yeah. nice nice to see you here thank yeah. you thank you for the invite professor uh, sanjay astana congratulations on this new book um so interestingly um i had written a uh, year and a half back something on uh, doordarshan and public service broadcasting and it was more from a nostalgia standpoint you know they were talking about it actually um uh, okay yeah, yeah. so i i wanted to uh, sort of reevaluate uh, and uh, seek your uh, sort of understanding where we are on that and if i may quote because i've forgotten what i wrote um, <laughs> so i just have it here mm -hmm. so i made some uh, one or two uh, sort of observations i don't know how relevant it is but i'm still keen on what public service broadcasting can still do but then are we overburdening the public service broadcasting and treating it as some holy cow or in a practical sense are we seeing today's liberal commercial corporate media doing more service than perhaps what pbs is doing i say it because in the immediate sense i was saying most of the channels have gone to maharashtra and they've gone down into the wells and they're covering you know end to end about the water crisis mm -hmm. and what i see on doordarshan is more ceremonial you know uh, day one of lok sabha and so, some more debates uh, of that sort so uh, just to serve my memory and i'm just reading that uh, few lines um so my question basically on 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 uh, these two aspects whether the are we treating pbs as a very holy cow uh, still relevant or not and uh, are we not being also a little biased for the good work that the commercial televisions are doing which are offering more public service and citizen journalism and things like that concepts like that and my other question is with deeper regionalization of television and media in the country you mentioned about uh, stratification or fragmentation of the audience and uh, to me that the uh, uh, the uh, unintended consequence of fragmentation is or regionalization of media is somewhere we are missing the interconnectedness which public service broadcasting or for that matter doordarshan always exemplified in 80s and mid 90s or till 90s mm -hmm. 
so uh, these are the uh, these are the questions but uh, i'll i'll uh, pass on uh, for you to answer that i just mentioned uh, somewhere that multi channel television universe and hyper commercial environment <coughs> caught doordarshan off guard and through newer challenges at it there is always the not issue of defining what is and is not public service pro uh, programming it seems to be confronting with the binaries as you mentioned um on the one hand be profitable and on the other hand deliver socially relevant and public service programming both seems both terms seems to be mutually exclusive and in a way unachievable at the same time um and uh, somewhere down um so the other is also the fear of sounding elitist or being boring creates dislike to produce any serious programming and uh, the popularity seems to be the sole criteria and value to measure uh, worth and commercial success as far as doordarshan is also concerned because it's aping what the commercial uh, satellite tv are doing <coughs> and uh, finally um i was of the view that it 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 is uh, there is a case for public service broadcasting mandate and uh, it's more relevant than um, ever before many of the cultural and uh, political trends strengthen the case for effective public service broadcasting in indian scenario which can benefit the society and that works uh, towards preserving the idea of interconnectedness so i thought what the greatest service that doordarshan perhaps did in 80s and 90s uh, i mean this generation the next generation don't realize it but satellite television has fragmented us and there is no interconnectedness i mean today we don't switch between a marathi you know a uh, movie or 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 we we will not go to anything else i mean either you're watching uh, a set of telugu channels or a set of hindi channels but that was the cross pollination of culture and various things happened during those days and i'm probably a book talks in great detail than uh, i could uh, thanks in the will thank you sir sanjay report but sai did you have a comment yeah please yes hi sanjay hi very good to see you here and congratulations uh you should all pardon me because i'm little off the academic jargon so whatever i say may not be really very very in depth and profound but i i have some observations to make and uh, probably a question at the end of it sanjay one uh, see uh when you talk about the state run media the first thing that comes to my mind or uh, probably you also mentioned since i have not at the book yet is the control that you're talking about the control on the content when you talk about the control on the content if you look at especially in the context of 80s i think it was imminent and it was inevitable because the media was at the inception and people didn't know what to expect from the media okay so whatever was offered was taken and i, I haven't seen any debates at least till the early 90s about you know criticizing what doordarshan was giving or what the state and media ar or doordarshan was giving so to that extent i really don't know the relevance of this in today's context because people didn't know what to expect so there was only one media and when the criticism started happening i think that's when the government of india decided to kind of privatize or have a decontrol in the name of prasar bharati which always remained a hoax i mean which like people don't even know today if you ask me the younger generation don't know what is prasar bharati but the mandate was that it was supposed to be you know decontrolled but it never happened it never happened because i think there was a onslaught of the satellite channels which happened in early 90s that's the second phase and the third phase which is the most dangerous phase is early 2000s when there was a onslaught of the news channels i think it made the whole kichdi of the you know media environment in india so i think whenever we talk about any research unless these three different phases are you know taken into uh, in a consideration and uh, seen as a bigger context i will not understand the relevance of 80s and the duration because i think it was meant to be what it was meant to be i mean there was there was nothing that people could do because they didn't know what to expect and today when you talk about uh, i didn't get your name sir sundar sundar when you say i i really have a problem when you say that more than any time before today there is a need for public broadcasting i think i'm not talking because i belong to one the private channels guy but <laughs> today the private channels are facing a threat from the ott what you mentioned over the top okay in in terms of what offering is given they are completely facing a threat from ott so where is doordarshan 
where is the place for doordarshan there may not be any place for even the private channels thanks to the lot of confusion that try has created in the recent past lot of people have migrated from the cable television to ott already in all the areas so in this context what's the relevance of the state owned media i really don't understand and, and especially you know the globalization is more meaningful than ever before because at the finger finger tip you have access to everything so in this context and i think that is the reason why i am jumping here correct me uh, as a professor i want to be corrected <laughs> i am jumping here because so much of flippancy is happening around the media today i think nothing serious is happening and hence there is no research which is happening on for, that for i think those of you who don't know sai he graduated from our university has uh, experience in public broadcasting but has spent what last 20 years yeah. in uh, corporate media in running uh, commercial television right i mean just to contextualize yeah, uh, uh, his background so, so he think, knows both sides of the coin yeah so. so i think because of whatever i mean i don't want to use a bad word but what a nonsense is happening in the media today <laughs> i think it, it doesn't attract the academicians or the research you know to do any, any serious study on this i think we lost it out you know i want your comments on this thank you i think uh, kanchan had a comment or a query yeah so the yeah satya also yeah satya go ahead then we can ask kanchan uh congratulations professor sanjay uh, i look forward to reading right so it's based on this discussion i have uh, a few two questions uh, i'll finish them quickly so if uh, does this scholarship come more under historical poetics uh, phenomenology and hermeneutics tradition uh if that's so then uh if it's not political economy or which is not instrumental in terms of uh, marxism or um, psychoanalysis uh there i am also uncomfortable with some of the scholarships for example some people have directly connected uh for instance broadcasting of ramayana and uh, demolition of babri masjid and rise of communalism so those kind of uh, analysis is definitely uh, problematic i agree with that uh, but when it comes to this kind of uh, uh, nuanced understanding and interpretation which we are talking of uh, what would be the response to that kind of scholarship is there some response that has come i haven't come across it and maybe you have covered it i look forward to reading it uh, but the, these are immediate problems which need to be addressed also uh, if not in that way what is the other way uh and we need to look at them and the second thing is while you're talking about uh, 80s uh um uh, durdarshan uh what i realized even while you are listing out the names uh, of programs is that i do not know any of them so it's it's absence for most of indians the public you are speaking of is exclusionary on a linguistic basis and there had to be a big fight especially from tamilians who uh, understate center state relations it's public money they're spending it only on hindi programming and it's a big fight by tamilians which slowly started hindi uh, with lot of uh, disinterest and then it moved on to other uh, languages by the time they moved on into other languages and again you have to switch to the hindi so it in, in a sense uh, this public was also there was some linguistic hegemony there uh, within that national framework there are some problems with this uh, uh, public uh, and it's the public's vernacular publics arrive only with satellite television in that sense because uh, doordarshan uh, regional stations were hardly uh, able to make a mark before the, these people came so i don't know how you address that decade because it's largely absence here except for the few educated uh, city dwellers who could understand hindi it didn't matter so what programs they had so we can have the head of the department have the last word last comment or question before turning to velusha well, again okay after after you no okay we'll let you you have the, you have the mic well, i don't want you you have the mic yeah okay Go all right uh, so um, look forward to reading the book uh, professor sanjay astana uh, and i think a lot of um, analysis related to information as well as the theoretical aspects got covered in the discussion it was a wonderful discussion also so i'm not getting too much into that except uh, one observation uh, if you look at i mean you 
the discussion was talking about this whole mandate of development that the state media had from which it moved later you know to becoming the more popular kind of media and catering more to you know what audiences uh, asked for and there's this burden you see you know slowly uh, i mean the media moving away uh, to just being a media for development so if you look at the chanda committee report that's again all about uh, the role of state in development and so on and you also see the pc joshi committee which talks uh, about moving away from this whole very burden of uh, development and becoming a more popular kind of uh, media so so that's also there i mean the conscious movement uh, towards being the more popular you know uh, and uh, media uh, medium for the people rather than just uh, catering to the development agenda so that was uh, one uh, observation uh, the other thing that i thought uh, was interesting was this whole uh, that many people have mentioned here about the nostalgia and the recovery that you are talking about uh, now i have two issues with that one is a lot of people are these days talking about this nostalgia many uh, commercial channels also have uh, uh, one or the other uh, you know uh, soap operas going on where they are talking about those days so it actually is ye un dino ki baat hai and all that mm-hmm. so they are trying to bring it back through the popular media so one is that but the other thing again which was mentioned by quite a few people here is all this nostalgia and you know romanticizing those days and uh, uh, you know talking about some of the thing uh, buniyad or uh, you know and all the other serials uh, is uh, you know for a certain generation um, my uh, i mean our children probably uh, do not remember any of this so my question is uh, who is this book for is it for the millennials at all or is it just to appeal uh, you know to to people who are of a certain um, well era let's say so that was those were the two things i wanted to say basically thank you usha <laughs> usha is a senior all india radio broadcaster <laughs> go ahead uh, i'm actually in the news section therefore uh, i probably have an inside view uh, frankly it's not much of a view uh, uh, because uh, uh, as you very well understand we are uh, facing times of turmoil now uh, all india radio and as well as me uh, being a part of all india radio uh, there's nothing clear now as i see it there's nothing clear now recently we've been told our news should be sabse sahi not sabse tez because our aim is sabse sahi not sabse tez that's our slogan now uh, we have a new technocrat ceo for prasar bharti who told us uh, don't aim for speed uh, so aim for uh, you know authenticity or whatever uh, but nevertheless we find that as being a part of all india radio we find now that the, our mandate is no longer clear uh, the policy is pretty fluid uh, we don't know we are uh, trying to be like them we are also trying not to be like them we are trying to get into you know post across you know cross posting across platforms uh, which are sometimes not related to audio at all which is primarily our medium and uh, we we are we are not really sure you know i'm often tempted to get off uh, and you know probably look for something else but then again you know i felt probably the same nostalgia or a sense of loyalty uh, where i think that maybe there's a teeny weeny window of uh, you know opportunity for me where probably i can do something but ultimately what my question actually is uh, you very well understand what where all india radio stands i'm not i'm sticking to radio i'm not going to do that <laughs> uh, so uh, have you seen something like this happening anywhere else in the world and what is the mantra that can probably you know save public broadcasting in terms of radio broadcasting is there a way to kind of i think actually there is radio is pretty relevant today because our listenership has gone up you know we are doing more diverse programming and there's hardly any control now you know so to speak there are no restrictions on what we broadcast what we can do the kind of formats we choose hardly anything i mean it's it's you can't really call it sarkari media any longer we are just doing everything possible so is there a mantra you know that could still probably make it more relevant you know keep it alive and vibrant have you seen a similar uh, model anywhere else in the world that's that's okay. what i wanted if sanjay has yeah. remembered all the questions and comments yeah. we'll i'll try to ask him to respond now to whatever yeah. he can yeah i'll try to uh, make it uh, within 5 minutes less than 5 minutes i know you know uh, usha sai prasad satya prakash kanchan sundar and uh, dr sanjay you know i have remember parts of the maybe you know begin with the the idea of radio and television if you remember the i have that in the book 1930s and 40s there was a great debate about the 
language, Hindustani language, and you know there was Gilchrist's, you know, the linguistic survey, the Great Linguistic Survey, 1840s, 1850s, Ijaz Ahmed, others written about it. So that debate itself is a way in which you know the radio they were conducted under the auspices of radio, and beyond that, the language debates uh, really fell apart. And recently, you know, we mentioned you know the three language formula that came up with Tamil Nadu, you know, the is there, right? Meaning it's still there with us, you know, it's not going anywhere. Uh, so the debates were there about Hindustani language, which could be heterolinguistic you know, Urdu and Hindi and all that. So that there was a debate in which J Robin Jeffries and other talk about Mahatma didn't like the movies and you know why, you know, so the national Indian anti-colonial nationalism really never considered the uh, broadcasting as a serious business. They were trying to cobble together, you know, they were also in the 40s and 50s, the Empire Radio, which was, you know, broadcasting. So the nationalists, except for a couple other people, you know, never really come to grips with it. So there is a connection and lineage within the radio and television language policy linguistic uh, you know the uh, is one issue the other is you know within development they conducted a whole lot of other kinds of things so i would say i will come to the recovery and the you know the, the relevance part but the other sundar said that you know the public uh, broadcasting whether it is real, is it a holy cow or is it something i think you know not to cite uh, british scholars or you know like graham murdoch and others have written a great debate about the normative uh, relevance of uh, of a public broadcasting network which could do justice to both the outside the boundaries of the state and the market. State and market dialectic is there, but you can't create a produce a third, you know, space. Uh, Anthony Giddens and others talk about the third space so much, right? So there is a way in which, you know, media scholars like you guys, you know, somebody could write and research that. So there is a normative uh, aspect of, to that. That yes, there is a relevance, but it is not a holy cow, but it is something more that you need to envision and sort of build it. You have to construct it. It's a, it's a long process, long drawn out process. The other thing is that, you know, I think uh, in my own mind, um, it is a question that, you know, the book is not for, uh, meaning is, is when I say that, you know, I'm bracketing out nostalgia. If you read the nostalgia chapter, nostalgia is a productive gain, but it is more about memory, which is partial, which is splintered, but memories which are political in nature, it's a politics of memory. It is not the Samuel, uh, the scholars who've written about the working group of 1970s, you know, the uh, the oral interviews and all that. But it is a memory which is more uh, phenomenological memory, which is in a memory about what you remember, how you remember. Like the Sikh community example. Sikh community yeah. is a one thing, you know, but it could be something else. I didn't do that, meaning I interviewed uh, a, a person, Dalit background, you know, that I didn't get much material there, but, you know, is a very different understanding of the of the serials that Satya Prakash you're talking about, which does not really relate to the urban middle class uh, set of memories. So memories are partial, memories are spling, mem memories are political in nature. But there is something there which we need to really recover. And not recover in the sense of, you know, bringing back the good old days, but really connect with the heterolinguistic traditions that were there. I myself, you know, my mother, you know, she was born in Lahore, Pakistan, uh, but she embodied her in, intergenerational family embodied. They spoke uh, perfect Urdu, Hindi, Hindi, not the Punjabi mix of Hindi and other kinds of languages. So that is a heterolinguistic traditions which Veena Das talks about it where, you know, people connect with each other in ordinary lives, you know, right? Hindus and Muslims and Christians. There's a certain kind of a ordinary language resources are there, out there, within which we are not killing each other, but we are living the daily lives. We are conducting ourselves in a way in which, you know, we can sort of, you know, the everyday, the, which is there, right? So the, heter the heterolinguistic traditions that were there within Doordarshan, 1980s, whether it was a Sunday regional programming in Marathi, which I would look forward to watching, or a Telugu movie, or a Kannada movie. Of course, it's a state mandated, you know, you can still do a critique of the state, saying that this was a middle class uh, movies of the uh, Govind Nihalani type, or, you know, some other, you know, movies of, you know, uh, but there was, you know, rich space where B.B. Karant and Girish Karnad, others produced, right, Anantamurti, there were, you know, a lot of other kinds of things. So that, that resources we need, ever so more, within the context of contemporary media. And in the private, I have nothing against, you know, market uh, driven media, but the problem is that the splintering of the audience also on the one hand is generating, you know, a lot of other, uh, within the context of India, the, the deep regional uh, stratification. So, of so Satya had this query on, uh, so what is the theoretical offering in response to those other hegemonic discourses? I mean, uh, whether it's Marxist or uh, psychoanalysis or... I, I think uh, Ajaz Ahmed, you know, I refer to him because, you know, he wrote uh, uh, that called the 
in the mirror of uh, in Urdu, he is about recomposition in, of language. He talks about the rich traditions of bhakti and you know the everyday vernacular, whether it is a Santukaram or a Mirabai or a Kabir or a Rahim or you know that language of that, the bhakti public is there. So I am not transposing that in a way to you know, but what I am saying is that yes, there are ways in which you know you can envision a public, but which is the linguistic you know, but linguistic not as something that is encapsulating you know me as a Hindu. Hindi speaker, but I am much more than that. I am, you know, I am able to speak a certain kind of a Dakani, a certain kind of a Telugu, a certain kind of a, you know, Urdu and a Hindi, uh, which makes me uh, more than what is imputed, right? As a sort of meaning, making meaning, right? So I understand in my own partial ways, understand, and you know, as Gandhi said, you know, we could live in, you know, with harmony without so in really. Your, in your epilogue, you talk about. The beginnings of some kind of a philological approach? To if, yeah, the philological approach, I am not going into that, but the philological approach, not the Sheldon Pollock kind of philological approach from Harvard and others, you know, the Sanskritist scholars, but there is a rich legacy within the Sanskritic traditions, which, you know, again, Leela Prasad and others, you know, scholars have written about outside the orbit of the Orientalist discourse or a Marxist discourse. Fascinating work, you know. Uh, so what I am saying is that you know there is not just the third space, but there are ways in which you know we could begin to uh, understand and really you know make a sort of sense of how we could sort of talk about an egalitarian you know uh, not of a public of a Kabir or you know like a Sant Tukaram, but you know but within our own resources that we could sort of gather and look at and perhaps regenerate the media space, the post-colonial media space, which seem to be on the one hand. Uh, greater greater privatization and greater you know corporate control uh, it is difficult to tackle and scholars have written about difficult to tackle private corporations and you know private uh, media then you know it's easy to engage with the state and french model could, could be a one good model because there was you know 1970s there was foucault and ricoeur and you know uh, others have uh, godard and others have debated on television about you know uh, kumar sahani also written about that that there is a way in which you can talk about uh, television which in educates and informs but also entertains and that could be outside the outside the grasp of uh, markets and the state and I don't know where it is I have no answer for that there is no mantra but perhaps we need to uh, maybe we need to you know re research or write or think you know and develop some of the resources there maybe. So size uh, take on relevance uh, I mean that could be like one final thought you could share <laughs> I mean, it is, uh, I think, an important uh, perception uh, among many people. I mean, it's yeah. uh, that, that, you know, what relevance is public television today, given the globalized uh, nature of information and communication. And so if, if we consider Doordarshan as a public television, you know, I know the Prasar Bharati, 1960s Chanda Committee has mentioned the Prasar Bharati took 25, 30 years to really bring that to fruition, but that too political, highly political, right? So the space is for relevance, you know, even if you look at Doordarshan as a public broadcaster, it is also trying to go the OTT way. Yeah. It is competing with Netflix and it is trying to figure out the millennial audience. It is all about the bottom line, right? Meaning how do you really cultivate an audience? which is more, you know, devoted, you know, to programming. So there is a competition, a healthy competition should be there. There should be choice and competition. But the thing is, you know, that we need to have uh, maybe regional public uh, networks or, you know, something of that to that effect. But it's difficult to answer your question because the relevance part is something that, so you just, know. Just to frame it uh, slightly differently in terms of the recovery project, you know, so is the recovery project about what Indian television was or is it about what it could still be? It could be both, in a way, yeah. Okay, different things, yeah. I'm not doing that too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and state state television uh, its role in the current context. I don't know whether we will be able to connect 80s, 90s because the whole set of political circumstances has changed for a large number of subaltern groups in the country because they are alienated now. 
right mm -hmm. so you uh, similar is you know you uh, you have a huge campaign uh, narendra modi saying plant a tree right and then you have 175 uh, 1000 hectares of land is given to adani in chatisgarh entire forest will be wiped out you know apart from the conflict and you know the tribal so the, these are uh, it's just not i think uh, post colonial i think we we need to have a newer kind of uh, terminology to whether the media represents the interests of the subaltern groups because the way uh, the i mean uh, the way in us for example you know you have huge corporate tax cuts and what companies are doing is they are buying their own stocks they are not producing anything else and look at the ceo salaries you know 1 is to 70 to 1 is to 400 and 1 is to 1000 right and similar is the you know in a case of a place like india probably we have to have more research into as i said state television you know um, you know the satellite channels I, i still it's still middle class dogma you know till this uh, customer uh, you have customer you have clients you have huge consumer market that supports television So unless uh, Sanjay has okay, <laughs> one last uh, comment. So the, the question Sanjay is also about the the struggle for sustenance is not only about nostalgia and relevance. It's also about the thirty-one thousand, twenty-six thousand workforce in the public broadcasting mm -hmm. setup. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is constantly as uh, my colleague from on india radio constantly trying to reinvent its relevance in the ott era uh, maybe your book will have a message as to how uh, nostalgia can be uh, uh, not necessarily youtubed but have a memory of continuity as many channels are now they are trying to take rights of hamlok and put it back uh, with the same kind of nostalgia i i, I think uh, that is a constant struggle although i know that in passing you mentioned uh, political economy as a theory is passe in terms of your work but i think uh, pendukar and others talk about the large impact of employment versus relevance of public spaces where they rediscover nation regionality stories etc and i think that is what durdarshan tried to do uh, and if you look at pc joshi which kanchan mentioned uh, television for whom and for what is the key question that he raises in which some of the discourses uh, purely from a marxist point of view mm -hmm. uh, so the report was called an indian yeah. personality for yeah, television indian personality yeah, yes. and uh, the question rhetoric question was television for yeah. whom and for what and joshi as you know is a declared marxist communist next so sanjay any final thought to round up and then we'll close here. yeah there's a couple minutes i think you know when i say state run media and if you remember it's not a public uh, media meaning it's a state run media and uh, the last point i would make is that you know if you read uh, the book which you know obviously in about 41 hour it's difficult to go through the main you know rehearse the arguments but you know it is you know i would want to generate more dialogue and you can you know uh, talk about it read it and if you would see you know some of the uh, larger arguments i'm making uh, and i think you would enjoy it meaning it's something that you know we need to have a greater debate you know debate always dialogue and debate always welcome right meaning to have you know perspective different perspectives different ideas uh, to you know run uh, sort of uh, sort of a intellectual uh, thought intellectual engagement and you know perhaps we all could you know maybe uh, develop some insights further insights uh, so i would only close by saying that you know read the book and if you have you know we can have a dialogue i would love to have you know thank you very much I appreciate it thank you very much uh, sanjay uh, pleasure having this discussion with you over the book uh, in the interest of uh, having this public conversation i'm sure i have simplified some of your arguments uh, I mean, the book is theoretically very sophisticated, and it makes uh, some very important uh, theoretical interventions in the way we have been studying this object called television and the Indian media. Uh, so, perhaps in a different gathering, in a different time, I'm sure 
will will get to uh, pick sanjay's brains on the uh, theoretical contributions he needs he has to make and i've seen some of you picking up the book i'm sure we'll uh, read and then engage with him if if only we the the university was open and our students were around we would have loved to yeah. have you back in the department uh, but thanks to all of you for being a wonderful audience and being here on a saturday evening uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, thanks sanjay once again thank you appreciate it. thank you